Good afternoon and welcome to this session. Um, this one is talking about movement building, advocacy campaigns, seminars, and legal clinics. So the focus is to examine what is happening on the ground, what scholars and students are doing to promote and pro to protect academic freedom in, the, in these various shapes and forms and for the different stakeholders in the academic freedom equation. And so we have three panelists that I'm privileged to introduce and to moderate their discussions. Their names are on the screen. Lavinia Francesconi, University of Chile. Professor Homer Hudfa, Concordia University. And Cynthia Tilden Mashlight, Berlin School of Economics and Law. I will introduce all of them at a go, and then after that, we invite Lavinia to start with her presentation. So, Professor Homer Hudfa is no stranger to us. She did the plenary on the first day, and she is a professor of anthropology emerita at Concordia University in Montreal. Her primary research and expertise lies in legal and political anthropology. Um, she examines the intersection of political economy, gender and citizenship rights, women's formal and informal politics, gender and public sphere in Muslim contexts. She has written profusely um, as an individual author or as um, joint author as well as being editor of various publications. And so she will be um, doing the second presentation for us. Then we have Lavinia Francesconi, who is a research assistant at the Human Rights Center of the Faculty of Law, University of Chile, where she's working on gender, inter-American system of human rights, indigenous rights, and international human rights law in general. She is a SA legal clinic advisor at the University of Chile. She's also a law graduate, cum laude from the Faculty of Law of the University of Bologna. And her work discusses a thesis on access to justice in Chile during the transition to democracy. She's been a volunteer for Amnesty International and has done some work for UNICEF as well. Then we have Cynthia Tilden Mashlight, who currently works as a freelance lecturer, trainer, and coach, and also learning materials writer. She was, former, she was um, responsible for English, business English at the Berlin School of Economics and Law. Uh, she has introduced three new courses in higher education. She's been a course developer for service learning as an elective. She's, been a, she's developed a new course on migration, as well as being a SAR advocacy seminar um, developer for business students. She's also um, has taught and been active in intercultural communication for many years, and is connected with migration uh, issues within the European uh, system. So these are our three panelists, and we'll begin with Lavinia Francesconi. We have, she has 10 minutes to do her presentation. Good afternoon to everyone, and thank you very much for the presentation. Okay. Uh, well, I was uh, asked to talk about advocacy, and well, I, I would say that um, in a very general way, advocacy uh, in matters uh, because in in the human rights field, because it's a, a medium through which people can actually 
alert the public opinion regarding threats and violation on, on human rights and academic freedom, of course. So uh, I don't want to say that as a cliche, but the academic world is the place where ideas should, and, and knowledge should, should uh, be spread independently and safely, and above all is the place where new generation should be educated through a critical point of view uh, that can ensure them the capability of understanding, of understanding better the world we live in. So we, as the Human Rights Center of the Faculty of Law of the University of Chile, we are strongly committed to advocate in, in the human rights, uh, in human rights in general, through our work, uh, specifically through our researchers, and uh, in, in academic freedom too, and thanks to the SAR collaboration. So I would say that advocacy is, uh, in my opinion, one of the most powerful tool, let's say from, from within and on, on the outside. Uh, that, that can actually visualize cases and aware not only the, the public opinion, but also the, the higher education community. And because as far as, as far as there is a supportive community who is concerned about those types of, of violations, and this, com this community, let's say, will we, we look after those victims and, and those violations, and hence it, it will create a, a big pressure or, on governments. And that's because they will know that they, they are being observed and from around the world, and there are people re really concerned who are ready to react. So and that's why in our research center, we, we created, as I mentioned, through SARS collaboration, um, a legal clinic in which uh, three students from our faculty of law work ongoing since August 2006. 17, I would say. Yeah, and so under um, the direction of um, Professor Mirna Villegas at first, and then to Nancy Yanez, who are both human rights experts in, uh, in Chile and in, 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 in the international community, let's say. And of course, with our three interns, uh, Margot, Micaela, and Camilo, well, we started to work in the SAR monitor process. Uh, actually to monitor and research uh, where, which were the more uh, relevant cases occurred in the past few years in Chile of violation of freedom of speech in higher education. So I may say that generally the violation that occurs in Chile on academic, on the freedom of, of the expression on academic freedom in general are um, relatively less violent than uh, or less visible than, than other that, that you may have heard. Uh, in Latin America, such as uh, all the, uh, the cases that Sarah has reported in Venezuela, or such as the Ayotzinapa case in, in Mexico, uh, which was one of the cruelest uh, violation of human rights, um, which has occurred in Latin America in the past years. Well, nevertheless, uh, the Chilean student movement has become a relevant factor on the educational politics since 2011, when uh, protests started all around the country demanding a free and, and better quality education. So I will not dwell in, in the cause of, this, of those protests, but uh, what is particularly for shocking for us is that those, those, those protests normally start starts, uh, start in a peaceful way and then they break into a violent repression from the police. And so we, and we are now facing a major challenge as new politic decisions have given rise once again to students' protests since March of the present year. And I would infer that, well, we will report new cases and of course we are going to lean on SAR collaboration in order to report them and advocate against those uh, violations. And finally, we are planning to do another type of ad advocacy, let's say, uh, within the United Nations mechanism. Uh, in fact, Chile will be reviewed under the UPR, the Universal Periodic Review, in two January 2019, and for the third time. And the UPR is a mandatory mechanism within the Human Rights Council, and it's universal because all states parties uh, participate in it as a reviewer and as a review. 
And so again, to create another type of advocacy, another type of, of let's say, pressure on the government, we are considering sending a shadow report, uh, which is allowed to, to send for, from NGO and, and university, and informing actually the, the Human Rights Council and all the states party that uh, all, the, all the cases and all the reports we have, we have been monitoring with, through uh, with the SAR collaboration. So I think that I just talked five minutes, so I will thank you, and I, if you have any questions, I will be very happy to answer it. So thank you very much. Okay. <coughs> well, you, um, I guess I have already um, given you all the story of why the reason why I'm sitting here is because um, a couple of years ago I was arrested in Iran and one of the things I discovered when I was there was that academic freedom has no legitimacy, even less legitimacy if, if anything than, than human rights dis discussion within the Iranian context and of course this, that applies the same with Egyptian um, and of course Turkey, these are the, re the region I know. So one of the issues for me has been uh, finding ways, seeing why, how is it that academic freedom has no legitimacy, has no public discussion, even amongst academics in the Middle East. I'm sure that it may be true in other parts of the uh, other regions, but I, I know Middle East more. So since I have been out, I've been trying to actually see why, um, the, um, looking at UNESCO document uh, 97, um, Recommendation 97, and see why is it that this document has not attracted attention. In the process of learning about that, I learned that when they wrote this document, actually there was no mobilization at the regional level or at, un at um, the, uh, different country level. So we have, we have only the, the legitimacy for uh, academic freedom is only referring to a few scholars, Western scholars, so we have no ways of uh, um, relating this to other regions. So it's, it's actually, I was told it was, it was a, a, a academic freedom is another imperial plot for undermining the uh, non-aligned non country and Muslim countries. So for that, since I have come out, I have been looking at ways that we can, we can really mobilize the discussion about academic freedom within different regions, but especially for my, where I work is the Middle East. So to get like, what are the academics that through the Middle Ages also suffered for their academic freedom? Because my um, discussion is that you can't really build a f uh, foundation in London or Florence or New York and then build a building in Lahore and Tehran and other places. You have to build the foundation there. So in terms of advocacy, I'm trying to organize student and other ac academic, we have all these, we have the history of what happened to the intellectuals in the past and how they suffered for their, their ideas, but it was never framed in academic freedom um, context. So to re revive that, to revive the fact that um, intellectual contribution of other regions to academic freedom in a way, I want to decolonize the recommendation um, recommendation 97 of UNESCO and make it much more available to people cl for claiming it, to own it. And for that, we need the advocacy of young scholars, people who work, and um, they can write that. I have been talking to a lot of colleagues here, um, but also in other, other um, countries where I have been in touch, to, trying to get their student and young people to work that and um, hopefully I get my star colleagues to be interested in organizing conferences in documenting the intellectual contribution of other regions to the academic freedom so that it doesn't appear as a Western tool that is for undermining the states in other parts of the world. So that's a very a stage one, but I think we look at pedagogy and the right to critical thinking Rather than like I had a colleague presenting like they have culture seminars on culture of resistance, I think rather than saying we have seminars on culture of resistance, we should have um, seminars on culture of the right to critical thinking. Because if you have that right, you don't then need to resist. You can do it. And it's making it things in a positive way so that we can bring more people in and make the right to critical thinking as a major part of also, not just academic freedom, but 
by the human rights issues. I'm happy later on to come back and discuss ab about how, um, how to make other steps that we can take to make the um, UNESCO recommendation more useful. Yeah, I know that already UNESCO uh, has not been very proactive, but there are already forces like a lot of the dictatorial um, regimes, including Iran, Egypt, and uh, Russian, they do want to actually uh, um, do away with uh, Recommendation 97, but on, as an academics, this is not the strongest document we have in hand, and we have to mobilize around it and use it and give it legitimacy so that the governments cannot just ignore it and want to destroy it. So that, uh, that's the, the angle I have taken on advocacy since my release um, a year and a half ago. So I stop here. Thank you and good afternoon. Looking around, I can tell that my timeline is much longer than many of yours in the room, but I'm a beginner as far as Czar is concerned, and I have just completed my first seminar of three months, so I'd like to tell you something about this experience. I have to go back a couple of years because uh, in the summer of 2015, we had in the city of Berlin an influx of refugees, mostly from Syria, from almost one day to the next. And over a period of a year, 85,000 refugees arrived to the city, and they all needed a place to stay. So universities like mine, the Berlin School of Economics and Law, began asking themselves, having meetings with staff, what can we do about this situation? Is there a contribution we can make? So um, I went, to, uh, at the same time, I went uh, down to a local site in my neighborhood, and I saw hundreds of Berliners active from the ages of 18 to 80 in providing uh, uh, services to people who needed emergency <laughs> services, medical, um, um, babysitting services, setting up beds, etc. And the university started um, discussing what we could do uh, for people who wanted to study or people learning, who needed to learn German, etc. So one of the uh, opportunities I had was to begin a course um, which we call service learning in the refugee effort. For many years I had, uh, perhaps it was a kind of a dream that I could sponsor, um, sponsor um, some program in community services at the university, so this was my opportunity. And since um, 2016, I've offered this course twice. And my students go out into the field and volunteer quite a number of hours in a semester and report on this. I offer information about migration and about migration policy in Europe, try to keep us all up to date on current changes in those policies. And we discuss their experiences as they volunteer in a, a vast number of different programs. Um, we um, have all gained from this experience. And last year, a uh, little bit more than a year ago, uh, my university joined Czar and asked me whether I wanted to offer a student advocacy seminar. So I started in October. I'm originally from uh, Massachusetts, and I make family visits every year. So just before the uh, semester started, I was in New York, and I visited Czar, which made me feel much more embedded in the, in the program. And I also visited Adam, whom I don't see at the moment, but Adam uh, Braver, who, who has um, who is very active in the student advocacy area and 
I was able to visit him at Roger Williams in Rhode Island. Um, so I felt as though this was really something I wanted to do. And we started in October, and it's been a very rocky road. I want to tell you what I think we've achieved, and in case I forget at the end, this is because I would like to encourage anyone who is interested in this area to, to leap in, to do something, including uh, starting such a seminar. I had six registered students, and five completed the entire semester. Now, our course is an elective. It's an elective that does not satisfy any requirements. We have credits for this course, but it doesn't satisfy requirements. So there we were, six to begin with, and five at the end of three months. This is a three-month course. We decided to begin research on Turkey. Um, you may or may not know that Berlin was and still is, I think, the third largest Turkish city in the world. We have a relationship to Turkey, and many of my students uh, come f have Turkish backgrounds. So we decided that Turkey was our country. And we, with the help of Tsar, we um, were able to select two scholars, brothers. We did this because this is, a, this is higher education in Germany, and my first language is English, but my students' first language is usually German. And I wanted to, be, to attract uh, both German-speaking students and English-speaking students, guest, guest students of ours. So, um, so we selected two scholars because one of the brothers had done his PhD in, at a German university. So we thought, at the beginning, we'd be able to find some information and some of our research could be in German and, and the rest in English. It didn't happen that way, but that was, that was the reason for our choice. So we had an incredible amount of support from Czar from the beginning with all of the materials you have that help you begin research. My students, uh, as I said, there were five. Uh, three of them are first semester undergraduate students. Okay, so this was a real challenge getting started. I would say it still is. Let me list a few of the things that we were able to accomplish in this three months. Um, first of all, we have no budget, um, and I was hosting a, a small um, workshop conference in November for people um, across Europe interested in migration policy, and my czar students catered that and so we, um, we now have a small budget from that, and we have so that, that we can use for any events that we want to continue with the czar effort. Um, December 10th, I think it was, is the um, UN Human Rights Day. So for this event, my students um, collected what we had researched to that point, what I think was really very helpful for a, a table that we set up in the uh, main hall for the UN um, Human Rights Day um, were the visuals that they had prepared. Um, it sends home a real message when you have a map of Turkey and you have all the pins on the map of universities that have been closed or where departments have been closed. Um, and where students no longer can study, all right? To visualize that was, I think, a real help. Um, and, of course, we passed out information about human rights, what they are, um, and we prepared a Kahoot quiz, if anyone knows Kahoot, um, so that students could come by and, on their smartphones, take this quiz on human rights and see how they did. Okay, and... Um, 
By the end of the semester, we had, we were overwhelmed by the amount of information we needed to research and the amount we had to read. But by the end of January, we had at least reached a stage where we felt we could write a report. This report we wrote in, that is they wrote, in English and in German. We have a class blog for human rights and it combines these two courses, the service learning that we do on the, on the ground here and czar um, advocacy. And so, and we have a Facebook page. So we think we've created a platform. Uh, we think we, we, have a, uh, we have a basis from which we can then continue. Um, I have a lot of work to do now because last week I found out that my seminar won't be taking place this semester. I don't have enough students. But I'll continue networking and seeing where I can perhaps embed this course in another area, another specific area, so that business students are encouraged to join. Um, I've decided not to give up. It was rather difficult last week, but being here this week really has encouraged me. And uh, we had a session yesterday afternoon where uh, we discussed this rocky road and I think if we join forces together and we offer students perhaps an international networking opportunity and all of us look to see what types of formats might work at, in our departments or at our universities, we will find a way, all right? So um, this was the beginning and, that's, and we'll see where we go. Thank you. Thank you very much for the initial thoughts. I have a follow-up question for each one of you before I open up the floor. For Frances um, Lavinia, um, can you tell us why advocacy is important? Why does advocacy matter in trying to uh, move the academic freedom agenda forward? What impact does it make on the ground that we should continue to engage in this advocacy? For, okay, you, you answer that and then I'll follow up. Or while we think about it, let me also put another question to uh, Professor. Can you also tell us, um, I mean, my research tells me that um, academic freedom has its roots in universities that were set up first in, in Arabic, um, communities centuries ago. Uh, I think the oldest existing university is still in Morocco or somewhere. So what are some of the cultural underpinnings of the understanding of academic freedom which can be used in this decolonization project that you are undertaking? And um, for um, uh, Cynthia, where do you go from here in terms of mobilizing the students? I think what you are doing is uh, very dynamic. Um, in what way can this agenda be, be, be feathered so that it can, we can have more impact being felt on the ground? So you want me to start? Okay, if you want to start. A couple of things. Um, where do we go from here? Um, Two minutes for each response, please, so that more questions will come from the floor. I teach undergraduates, undergraduate business students. And the first question we have on anything that is new, that is added on, that is not part of the curriculum is, what's in it for me? And I think that's always the challenge. So that's what I have to do. I have to find uh, opportunities with others um, and formats where I work that I think will work in the future. What we've done so far is just started, tried a few things out, tried to create a basis. 
And so where I go from here is trying to encourage more colleagues to join in. It is a volunteer effort and um, addressing internally and trying to build awareness internally, perhaps before we go out, all right? We do live in Berlin, so we do have political parties. We do have um, all kinds of federal offices we can approach. Um, but what I first want to do is drum up business where I work. Thank you. Lavinia. Um, well, it's a great question. Uh, I, I think I would say that actually uh, advocacy is, is supporting in some kind of way, and it's, and I guess it, it has it, its root in, in solidarity. I mean, uh, if you see something going wrong in another country, then you you do some actions in order to support it, and and I think that maybe in in you know, really general way that's what what advocacy is about. And, and through this monitoring process, I mean, SARI is, is showing solidarity and, and supporting the, those, those types of violations. So, and, and actually I would say, uh, I know, quoting my, my director of thesis, uh, finally we, we don't, when, when we talk about human rights, they're, they're usually not recognized, but they're concurred. So uh, I think that advocacy, it, it is the means to, to do so. Okay, thank you very much. Well, yes, um, going back to, um, at, at least in the Middle East, um, university, all the you know, current universities are more than 1,200 years old, but if you talk to a lot of people, they think universities were just came in the 20th centuries because they haven't learned to relate, to connect the intellectual work of today to the past. And for me, it's, it's quite clear that if we want academic freedom to have its roots in, in the other societies, people have to own it. At least, especially, I come from women's, women's rights movement, and I know unless you organize, then women everywhere in the world feel they own the movement, it's not going to succeed. So one of the ways is for people to, to learn that, in fact, intellectual freedom and academic freedom is not some, an import of the West, but it is actually, an, an, all people of, um, uh, in the world have contributed to our, um, our knowledge and civilization today, so they can then go back and have, a, have to see what share they have so they can own it. It doesn't have to be in every single country, but it can be in um, regional clusters and people can do it. And how I thought I'd do it like I do with colleagues, you students write all these papers and they always work hard. It's not very difficult to go and discover biographies and reframe it in, within the academic freedom. In the Middle East at least, uh, it's even worse in Europe. We have so many scholars that have given up their life and have, uh, have died, especially in the Middle Ages, because of their ideas and the work they have done and the contribution they have made to the world today. But very few as, as scholars, my colleagues in the Middle East very rarely discuss academic freedom. They talk about human rights, but not academic freedom. If we don't recognize our own rights and respect it and discuss it and demand it, our governments, especially those dictatorial governments, are not going to respect it. They're going to present it as a tool of imperialism if we treat it like that. And so my way is to, to actually encourage young people to look back at uh, the history of academic freedom and, into, and the right to critical thinking um, from, from their own region, from their, their own cultural background. Because also I don't see this as a short term. It's not something we can achieve in a year or two years or six years. I think it's a long term. Um, and if you look at it as a long time, it will take years for this to establish, so we need to work with young people. And um, also, it's not the only thing. I mean, there are the history of in in intellectualism, but also I think SARD is doing a lot of dealing with the symptom. But I just feel we also need to deal with the roots of the problem. That is recognition, the right to critical thinking, which is now questioned in so many parts of the world. And if we want to do that, we need to work in many, very, very many different directions. And that's 
That's how I view, but it, one step at a time. Like as my Lynn Friedman, one of my colleagues says, it's like salami, just one slice at a time, <laughs> and we will get there. Thank you very much. So we now open the floor. If you have any questions, comments, contributions to the discussion, you're welcome. Uh, thank you very much for your presentations. Actually, I would have about 50 questions to each of you. I'll pick one. Um, Cynthia, could you tell us a little bit more about the student advocacy seminars, what the objective is? You said you drafted a report at the end. What was the strategy behind that? Who was that addressed to? What are the students um, asked to advocate for and who are they asked to advocate to? Thank you. Anyone who wants to offer an advocacy seminar has a lot of support from Czar, all right, so that um, you can discuss with your students which country you want to focus on, or countries, it depends on the, uh, on the size of your group. And um, we decided on Turkey. And then we spoke with Czar about helping us find individuals we could campaign for, and we took their suggestions. So it wasn't something that I decided or the class decided, um, but we followed Czar seminar guidelines, basically, because we're, we started from scratch. Um, and first we did general research to find out something about these individuals. Um, it was not easy. We um, had to go back to Czar and say, we found some information. We can't tell where these two are now. Can you help us? And we were helped with a few more bits of information which we discussed and continued. The, uh, the goal was really in this semester to gather information as, um, and to find out more we could about the country and why the country is in this situation and why the individuals are in the situation. We didn't complete this task. Um, uh, it took us, we had three months, it took us two months to find out whether these two individuals were still in prison. So it was rather frustrating along the way. Yesterday we spoke about moments of frustration because you feel you, you're not getting anywhere. Okay, so we kept flip-flopping back and forth, country information, uh, um, asking Czar for more help, which we received, and putting the parts together. The report, you would say, is a preliminary report. If I had the if I had the opportunity this semester, we would continue with Turkey in any case. I would just add we on. We were that. overwhelmed by, by this, by how much we needed to learn. Turkey is an incredibly difficult country in, in which you would try to find a, a case of an individual scholar to do advocacy on their behalf. Um, and so I'll just add a little bit more onto that. So uh, I work at Scholars at Risk as an advocacy officer here officer here and I work often with the seminars. Uh, so as Cynthia mentioned, we work with the seminars to identify a case based on student interest, uh, occasionally language capabilities that may be useful as well, uh, the background of the faculty advisor, uh, which may be useful in certain cases. Um, and so the students put together those dossiers, which really serve as kind of the foundation for the advocacy that they'll lead throughout the semester or occasionally some seminars uh, go on throughout the whole academic year. Um, so uh, in many cases, the dossier is then used to arrange meetings, to arrange communications with uh, relevant stakeholders. So um, just last month in March, uh, we brought students down to Washington, D.C. to have meetings with congressional representatives, senators, uh, officials from different NGOs uh, to discuss these cases. So uh, they often ask for uh, uh, additional uh, expressions of concern for you know, medical uh, care, uh, legal counsel, 
um, to have a fair trial, uh, to have family visits if somebody in their family passes away, which often happens. Um, and so the students work on, on those very tangible humanitarian concerns. Um, and in some cases, they will also broaden uh, the scope of their advocacy uh, for really back to the country. So possibly in the case of uh, Turkey, I know we had students down in DC who were talking about Venezuela, but who were working on a specific academics case. Any other questions, comments? Yeah, I'm Ibrahim from Cameroon. Uh, the question I have is on the seminar because <clears throat> as a refugee, um, during some seminars, those giving the seminars never tell us that they are, or they were at one point, refugees. Yeah. And well, once you say that word, it makes a big difference, not only as a scholar, but the way to integrate in that environment where you are. And the second question, <clears throat> question I wanted to ask, or that was just a point, was that how is Saar trying to bring back the deleted history? Because there's, in, every, in every situation there's a history, for example in Cameroon, we are not taught how the transition happened. And I think these are all those things that uh, could also help people moving from one point to the other because of problem and because this directly changed their uh, way of thinking and their, 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 their educational state as well. Can any of you respond? Um, so I'm happy to say a few words about it. So in the case of you know memory and how do you uh, keep that sort of understanding going so we can avoid future problems. So. Uh, that's a major part of SAR's work that has started over the past couple of years through our Academic Freedom Monitoring Project, and this is something that Lavinia has been helping us with. You know, in the, the past uh, several years, we haven't had very much data uh, come through the project uh, from the country of Chile. Um, now, thanks to Lavinia and her students, we've been able to identify incidents that are reportable and helps us to build an image of uh, academic freedom conditions in that country. Um, so that's through the monitoring project and on an annual basis through our Free to Think report, we're able to take a deeper dive into some of these country contexts. So uh, the case of Turkey, for example, uh, 2017 was the second year we did a chapter on that country and uh, the ongoing crisis there. And we've looked into you know, the contextual uh, basis of uh, the attacks in that country, uh, how things have evolved over the past several years, um, and we're hoping that these reports continue to, to build that sort of uh, memory and uh, help us to keep up a good warning sign when uh, these issues may arise in other countries. Oh, there's a hand up here. We're getting a workout today. <laughs> um. Thank you, Gary Bystrom from Bard College Berlin. I uh, have a follow-up question for Professor Hoodfar. Uh, I also teach a, an advocacy seminar, um, and I really have been so taken by your idea of having the students write papers about historical um, figures from, from the background that they're particularly coming from. And I'm just wondering if you have any ideas about how to take that project further. Like, is there, do you imagine a kind of digital archive of this? Do you imagine student conferences in which students are coming together to share their ideas or, or the histories that they've been able to draw up? I mean, how do we move from, you know, individual people assigning it that as a assignment in a class, which uh, I'll definitely think about doing to making an impact more broadly on uh, decolonizing ideas of academic freedom. Um, in the past, I have done kind of practical seminars for, for my student in Montreal where these are undergraduate first year, but they, I send them away to do research in different parts of Montreal and then I, t I actually printed a book you know, we have series of books of called Montreal books from the student point of view. So I kind of foresee that kind of thing has done. When I discussed this at the University of Toronto, 
um, a few months ago, um, we suggested that the student, um, a colleague encouraged the student to write, I will provide, I mean, I have already provided some lists of people that I thought it was, they were important from, for the Middle East. Um, get them to, um, to write the essays, and then we, were, we can both publish them di uh, digitally, but also put them as a book so that, and encourage this kind of discussion to, um, to go in, and uh, hopefully at some stage we can get, have enough budget to get the student together. At least in Canada, graduate students have um, conferences every year, so I'm hoping that we can have panels on, on uh, those um, conferences. So in, in fact, bring this in, but not just, not just doing it in the West, of course, since I am situated in, in the West, that will be there. But these are the kind of thing people can do, whether they're sitting in Cairo. I mean, even if the situation is very repressive, nobody says, don't go and look at the life of the, some middle, middle ages <laughs> scholar, because people have been doing that. So it's not a dangerous thing to do, but it is a very useful exercise. So they can be involved. My other suggestion has been to my colleagues that clearly we can't say bring thousands of uh, Turkey to, to Europe for universities don't have that capacity, but we can give them little budget, like a few thousand, and encourage them to write paper because part of the problem with them is not always a question of being somewhere. Um, a lot of them maybe financially somehow can manage, but it's just that the question of identity. They were researchers, they were intellectuals within the university setting, now they're at home, they can't get a job elsewhere. But if they know that there, are, there is an affiliation, even if they are sitting in Istanbul or some s little city or in Tehran, then they can write a paper and they can be part of this network um, with a little reward for recognition of that. It, it is, you, you bring that kind of discussion back. It's not a very difficult thing. And I know SAR originally, when it was uh, making the policies, they had the policy to discuss academic freedom in different regions, but then they didn't have budget, and I guess at that time it didn't seem to be so crucial. But of course, as the time has passed, we can see that it's becoming much more central to the, to the whole question of scholars at risk. Okay, any more questions, comments, contributions? All right, so I think um, we would like to bring the discussion to a close. What we have heard uh, is about how we can start a movement to promote advocacy campaigns and seminars and legal clinics and other means to bring some energy into the Academic Freedom Project. So here we are talking about practical steps that can be taken on the ground. And we are privileged to have heard from the three speakers who, have, uh, who are coming from different backgrounds or different parts of the world are doing different projects which relate to uh, this. It's similar to what we are also doing back in Ghana where we are conducting a monitoring project in West Africa. We have set up a West Africa a monitoring desk. So what we do is to every week go through the newspapers and listen to the news items and go on the internet and so on and pick cases of violations of academic freedom based on some set criteria defined by SAR and then report on this as well as seek verification of the, the information we receive, and then think about what can be done to bring justice or to end the violation that each particular person or institution is facing. So I believe we've all taken a cue from the experiences that have been shared here, and we are motivated to go and start something on our own. And if there need be, that will need any guidance or support. SA is ever ready to come to our aid as uh, Cynthia has tried to let us understand that where they needed help, they went to SA and SA was ready 
to help. So let us all be advocates as we live here. And let us all contribute to help save at least a scholar or an institution from violations of academic freedom. That is still ongoing. Thank you very much. For Can I just make one comment? Just, just before everyone goes, I, wa I just wanted to make one more comment. Um, I think movement building, logic, and all this is grew. I know at the university we are told, leave our passion home. But I want to say, you can't build a movement if you don't bring your passion in. And so bring your passion and let the SAR also know that you are interested. Get your pa transmit your passion to your students so they would follow that. And I think it's very important. Often we try to be um, take him back and, and be very logical, and sometimes that doesn't stimulate our a student to, to follow and get involved in this. So I think maybe in this one case, we have to break the academic rule and bring a little bit more passion to build our movement. <laughs>